Louis XIV became king at the age of five and ruled for 72 years. He was the longest reigning monarch in European history, known as the Sun King. Today, we are going to look at the rise of absolute monarchies in Europe. But absolutism wasn't the only form of government shaping the European landscape at this time. Other forms of government, most notably in England, began recognizing the rights of individuals and limiting the authority of the monarch. Hi everyone, my name is Todd Beach. I teach AP European History at Eastview High School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. That's a suburb of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I'm Katie Lancey. I teach at Coral Gable Senior High and that's in a suburb of Miami, Florida. And this is AP Live Review. Welcome, we're happy to have you guys with us today. All right, so as we move into our day today, we wanna to kind of start off by talking about what our purpose is in doing these reviews for you. We know that the AP exam is right around the corner. And what we wanna do is supplement your learning that you've had this year in your own AP Euro class with your own AP Euro teacher. Um, we're gonna explore essential content in each lesson. And we're also gonna provide you practice for the upcoming AP European history exam. We encourage you to engage. We're gonna give you homework practice. And today we're gonna to start by going over yesterday's homework practice. We want you to understand how to be successful. And in each session, we're gonna go over the previous day's homework. So please practice and we're helping you to learn and prepare for this exam. And we also wanna remind you that we want you to feel a sense of community. We know that the exam is right around the corner and there are students all over the country and, and international schools all over the world who are really wanting to start preparing and studying for the exam. And we hope that we can help you do that. All right, Todd, tell us about our, uh, our day today and what's coming up. Great, thank you, Katie. So yesterday, we you can see in session one, um, we did content review and then we did the skill development where we were talking about how you respond to the short answer question. Yesterday's content review was Ren Ref or Renaissance Reformation. And then homework was we gave you uh, an opportunity to write some SAQs. And then today, session two, our content review is we're going to talk about absolutism and constitutionalism, as we talked about just briefly in the introduction. And then for skill development, we want to talk about how do you construct the contextualization part of the exam for, and the thesis or the argument or claim for the long essay question and the document based question. And so our homework is going to we're going to ask you to write a context and thesis paragraph in one paragraph. How can we do that in one paragraph? You can see coming up in session three what our content review is scientific revolution and enlightenment and session four French revolution and Napoleonic era. And you can also see the skill development. We're continuing to build those skills for the essay response. So make sure you're checking with session three and session four and follow us because we're gonna help you work through that. Awesome. All right, so let's review. We gave you some homework that was for today and we gave you a couple of options to try to practice the SAQs that we talked about in our last session. And the first one that we're gonna talk about today is SAQ1. SAQ1 is the secondary source interpretation. And so you have a, a passage here that is from a historian's uh, look back at a historical event. That's what you can expect in SAQ1. And then you actually had a uh, prompt here that had several different tasks, several different task verbs. And we talked about what you do with those ta 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 task verbs uh, last session. And so we're gonna go ahead and model one of the answers. And this is actually an answer that a student did on the AP test. So we wanna go through and talk about what was really, really well done in this response. So remember that SAQ number one is gonna be a secondary source. We want you to make sure that you've looked really clearly at what the verb is that the College Board is asking you to do. And we are gonna model a strategy here that Todd and I find really helpful with our students and it's a T strategy. And we'll go over that as we look at the answers today. So this is, you can see uh, an actual response. You can see the handwriting. We've gone ahead and typed up the responses to make them really clear for you, but I'm gonna go ahead and take a quick reminder so that your handwriting should be as neat as you possibly can make it. Remember, you have a real person grading your response. So I think that's really important. We have the T structure here that we've kind of identified on the handwritten response, but let's look at it together on the typed response. So again, we really like this T structure because if you get in the habit of doing the SAQs and this can translate also to the long essay answers, this will help you really kind of format your response. So we're gonna start off with a topic sentence. 
um, this question, if you remember, asked for what was the limitation on the historian's view. And so we'll start off with one limitation of de Stael's view of the French Revolution is the rise of Napoleon. So that's our topic sentence. And then we move on, what's our evidence or example? Through the French Revolution, they created a representative government. The end result was the rise of a dictator, All right? So there we go, the, the student has answered the question, they've given an example. And now we're gonna move into a little bit stronger analysis the French Revolution's representative government was not successful and didn't lead to progress like Destail claims. And so this was a question that asked for the limitation of the view and a piece of evidence that would limit that view. And the students done a really nice job. They've not only named the evidence, they've gone through and explained it and they've done analysis on it and they've given a nice example. So this was definitely an example that would have received the point on for part C. All right, Todd, do you wanna to talk a little bit about the image? Yeah, thank you, Katie. That was really clear for SAQ1, again, with that secondary source. SAQ2, the short answer question number two is gonna be a primary source. And in this instance, they've given you an image. So always read the source line, because that's always important. We have a French artist, and it is Colbert presenting the members of the Royal Academy of Science to Louis XIV, 1667. So we see this image, and you should take some time to really kind of break down that image and see what you see in there. And I think yesterday we talked about how the center of the image is going to be Louis. He's the one seated with the staff in his hand. That staff kind of identifies him as the important person. And then you see all these members of the scientific community around him, and then they're showing him maps and globes, and we have bones in the background and all kinds of things that, that uh, the French artist has populated this print with. All right, and then our, our three tasks are describe, describe, and explain. And so it is, SAQ is going to be that primary source, as we said, and we want you to use a T-structure. So here is the sample response. This is the actual original response. And now here is the typed response. And this is going to be a describe. So it doesn't need to really necessarily have the analysis, although Katie and I will tell you as we tell our own students, just get into the habit of doing the complete T structure. So it reads, King Louis XIV likely commissioned the painting as a way of showing his support for the sciences and legitimizing his authority as an absolute monarch. That's a great topic sentence. It puts it right on point. And now we need to support it with this evidence or example by showing his grandeur and being surrounded by intellectuals like Jean-Baptiste Colbert, he was making himself more royal in the eyes of the aristocracy. So the, this structure, and again, we could have gone further with the analysis, but the demand of the task word was described, so we didn't have to. Um, but this does a really good job of you know, getting to the point of, of the question itself and answering the question. Okay. Absolutely. I like that image. Okay. So our, our content piece today is really to talk about unit three and to talk about absolutism and constitutionalism in Europe. And Todd's going to start off by contextualizing state building. Okay. So when we were talking yesterday about Renaissance Reformation, remember that the real big authority that has been omnipresent in Europe at this time has been the church. But now we're seeing a shift at this time where monarchs are trying to grab more authority. And because you've got this tension going on between the two of them, you know, that there's, that's gonna lead to other things that are going on. So the context of war and economic depression, 17th century monarchs began to make new demands on their people. France, Spain, Central Europe, and Russia attempt to centralize authority through absolutist governments. But what's going on in England and the Dutch Republic is they're going to utilize more constitutional style governments to move their societies forward. But both absolutist and constitutional governments face similar obstacles in achieving their goals. So you have to think about this. What does a secular state want? Um, they want to create more power and authority. And in order to do that, they're going to need to have tax the people because they're going to offer services. So that means it has to be paid for. So they're going to try and achieve that level of centralization or central control through greater taxation. They want a growth in their armed forces to enforce these laws that they're going to be putting on uh, into their regions and to defend their lands. They want larger and more efficient bureaucracies to collect taxes and distribute payments as needed 
and they need this compelling, compelling obedience from subjects. And the key word there is subjects, not citizens. Okay. So that's kind of the context around what's going on. So next, we're going to look at our learning objective for absolutist approaches to power, explain how these forms of rule in absolutism affected social and political development. And I think we're going to be looking at Louis XIV and his finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. And we're going to be looking at Peter the Great and how he, quote, westernized the Russian state. So we'll start with this great image, classic image of Louis XIV. Um, showing off his legs, if you will. I'm sure the French painter really appreciated this. It's all draped beautifully. And everything about this is, says he's royalty, he's important, he's lavish, he's wealthy, he's powerful. So and it is kind of that official portrait, and we see it everywhere. So getting into this, Cardinal Richelieu was the minister of the crown on behalf of Louis XIII. He had enacted policies to strengthen and centralize royal control in France, he suppressed Protestantism within France. The, those are known as Huguenots. And he's going to extend the use of intendants or intendants, these officials appointed by the monarch. The intendants are administering local laws and they report only to the king. So you kind of start to see the structure that they're making using intendants in the local areas. They're, they're, they're responsible to the king. Louis XIV becomes king at the age of four or five. His mother, Anne, will act as his regent because we don't want the five-year-old making the decisions. And then Cardinal Mazarin is, is his chief minister, the person who's going to be the, the everyday person. Mazarin continues Richelieu's centralizing policies, but his desire to increase royal revenues led to a series of rebellions. So taxes, royal revenues, led to these rebellions throughout France, especially in Paris, known as the Fronde. Okay? Um, Louis embraces, believes, values, completely is in the same head space as the idea of divine right of kings. He is the king because God has appointed him. He will acquire the title sun king that emphasizes his central role in that divine order. And you go to Versailles and you see images of sun everywhere. Even on doorknobs, you see these images of the sun king. Louis never called the estates general. So with the Estates General, and we're going to get into that when we talk about uh, the French Revolution, but the Estates General is kind of like this representative uh, body, but he's never going to call the representative body during his reign, because to do that would be to acknowledge that they have some authority, and he's not going to do that because he is the divine right monarch. So in 1685, one of the first things he's going to do to, again, impress his power is he's going to revoke the Edict of Nantes. The Edict of Nantes was this disposition that Henry IV, his grandfather, had granted Huguenots, those are French Protestants, uh, the right to worship in certain towns. And so he's going to take that back. He demands that Huguenots renounce their faith. He calls for the deconstruction of their churches, closing Huguenot schools. Because of this, there's obviously going to be great disorder and disruption. And over 200,000 Huguenots will flee France Many of them are skilled artisans, and that's going to have an effect on the, the, the economic effect is going to be felt in France. Here we see this amazing image of Versailles. It's one of those things that you want to make as a bucket list that you can one day visit Versailles. And the, the interesting thing about this image is it's, it's painted in 1688. Um, if you go to Versailles today, you can even like Google Earth it, and it's just so much more forested. The other thing that is also interesting about this image is there are no mountains around Versailles. So the <laughs> artist has done a little bit in the background there to give us this amazing image. But there, we've been there and there are no mountains, but it, it really still does a nice painting. 1682, Louis moves his court to the newly renovated Palace of Versailles. You know, he was affected by the Fronde in Paris. He distrusts Paris. Um, Paris is like many medieval cities at this time, late medieval cities, it's very crowded and there's a lot of disorder and he feels safe at Versailles and he's gonna make Versailles his seat of government. He's gonna use that palace to curtail the power of the nobility. He's gonna make them, require them to reside at Versailles for different months of the year and some longer to compete for his favor and again, to put them in their place. And so we start to see also this tension that he's constructing that it was our, didn't need to be constructed, but he's constructing more of this tension between king and nobility. He's going to use an elaborate set of court rituals surrounding all his daily routines. So like 
in the morning. There's got to be some nobles that show up in his in his bedroom that show and watch him wake up. You know, all of this is so that they understand that he is the king and they are not. And so he he makes them go through these rituals. Uh, point C. Versailles becomes the center of European politics and French culture, and it grows in international language. French is going to replace Latin as a language of scholarship. Language became the language of learning and diplomacy. It was not unheard of to be in a German or even Russian court and hear French being spoken. That's how much influence he had on the culture at the time. France's economy is going to flourish in large part due to Colbert, who does a great job of making the economy serve the state. However, um, as we're going to see, this is going to be a growing problem with France in that revenue streams don't seem to match expense streams. Some of that has to do with how much he's at war. Okay. Let's shift to what absolutism looks like in Russia at this time. We'll start with this print of Peter the Great being shown plans during the foundation of St. Petersburg. So St. Petersburg, the city, is created on the orders of, of Peter the Great. So Peter the Great, you know, he's this legendary image, six foot seven, and he had, as a teen, traveled to the West. And in his travels to the West, he sees that there is much that, that Russia needs to catch up to the West with. He is primarily interested in military power. There's some great uh, examples of when he was a child and he's the czar in waiting, if you will, about playing war games in his backyard, but he, Unlike uh, you know, children of today, he's really got real weapons, real uniforms. So that was probably a little dangerous, but he grew up in this kind of mindset. He's very interested in military power, determined to redress the defeats of previous armies of the Tsar. And he's, they'd suffered with wars of Poland and Sweden since the time of Ivan the Terrible. So to get the title, the great territorial expansion is what we need, is the soul of Tsardom. Peter would know only one year of peace in his 36 years of rule, War and expansion will consume 80 to 85% of the state revenues. And that is just a mind blowing total because that means there is so much, there's so little left to do anything domestically, including this building of St. Petersburg, if everything is about expansion and war. Point C, a consequence of all of his war making is the influx of Westerners and Western ideas into Russia. And we get a new class of really educated Russians that begin to emerge. And then point D, his reforms will create a more modern army and state. It was introduced to Western civilization that paved the way to move Russia closer to the European mainstream during the Enlightenment and during the reign later of Catherine the Great. All right. Thank you, Todd. Um, I love that image. And there's a lot of comparisons that can be made between those two monarchs. So that's something I always have my students think about. And then there's a, um, some contrasting that we can do as we move across to England and we're looking at a, sort of a different model of government. So for our learning objective, we're looking at explaining the causes and consequences of the English Civil War and the idea that the English Civil War, which was a conflict between monarchy, parliament and elites over their respective roles in the political structure in England, exemplified the competition for power among monarchs and competing groups. We're also gonna talk about this other historical development that the outcome of the English Civil War and then the Glorious Revolution, and I think the Glorious Revolution is another one of those anchor dates that we talked about in our last session, the kind of knowing these, these major moments that happen in AP Euro. Um, it protected the rights of the gentry and the aristocracy from absolutism through assertions of the rights of parliament. So here, after the Glorious Revolution and the subsequent English Bill of Rights, we're gonna see that sort of seesaw of power tip in favor of parliament in England, which it hasn't done with the monarchies that you just talked about in France and in Russia. So the English Civil War, um, we kind of contextualize that by starting with the shift from the Tudor family to the Stuart family. The death of Queen Elizabeth I in 1603 is really the beginning of that. She's an immensely popular monarch. She has no heir to the throne. Um, she, her throne goes to the Stuart family of Scotland and James I, who is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, steps into the role of monarch. And like the monarchs in Russia and France, he also believes in the divine right of kings, that his power to rule comes directly from God. So he's arguing that that power and authority is his. Um, religion is also part of this conflict. 
um, we have really we're setting up an Anglican versus Calvinist or Puritan uh, dynamic here. Religion's going to play a role. Many of these Calvinist Puritans are seeking to further the English Reformation by removing elements of the, in the, of the Catholic Church that are still in the Anglican Church. That's where that name Puritan comes fr uh, from. They want to purify everything Catholic out of the Anglican Church. Um, and James I really sums up his ideology with the phrase, no bishop, no king. And so he means by that that the enforcement of the bishop's authority and religion was essential to maintaining royal power. He believed that people who didn't like really respect hierarchy in church weren't going to respect the hierarchy that he was in charge of. So both James I and his son, Charles I, have disputes with Parliament because, of course, we're looking by contextualizing to see what are these monarchs going to do to provoke a civil war, right? So these disputes in Parliament are really the beginning of that. Parliament had had the power of taxation, the power of the purse, um, but Charles is going to avoid hearing grievances by refusing to call Parliament, and there will be no Parliament between 1629 and 1640. So during this time, he has to find a creative way to get money for his war, sort of creative fundraising attempts. And he does this by levying ship money. And ship money is uh, a tax that has been on the books in England, and he sort of resurrects it. It's uh, uh, money for defense during, uh, during wartime, but he collects it during peacetime. And he extends that tax, which originally was for the port cities, into the inland counties of England. And he does this without approval from Parliament. So the Scottish Calvinists are going to revolt, and then he is going to be forced to call Parliament to get funds. So the ship money is definitely one of those things that I think students stick with, that that's a major no-no that's going to start to sour the relationship between the, monarch and par the monarchy and Parliament that's going to provoke this conflict. Um, we have here this image of Oliver Cromwell. Uh, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but viewing the body of Charles I. So we know things are going to go south, right? We have Charles I, and he is going to continue to provoke this conflict to a point where he's going to lose his head. So um, under Charles I, there'll be a long parliament that does sit from 1640 to 1660. It would like to continue to meet, and it does that. Uh, trying to limit the power of the monarchy, it passes the Triennial Act, and that requires the monarch to call Parliament at least once every three years, because this was a major grievance between Parliament and the monarchy. Um, Charles I will enter the uh, the Parliamentary Hall. He's going to try to arrest MPs, members of Parliament, and when he fails to be able to do that, he's going to leave and he's going to raise an army. And in response, Parliament is going to form its own army. And so now we have the, like, the, the basis for what's going to be this conflict. Um, the new model army will be under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell. He is a very devout Puritan. The English Civil War will ensue, and the new model army will capture the king, kick out members of Parliament that don't support Cromwell and, and, the, and the Puritans, and put the king on trial for his life. Um, this will be tried by something called the Rump Parliament. Not all the members of Parliament are there, and it will find uh, against the king. It will find uh, the king guilty. And on January 30th, 1649, uh, Charles I will be beheaded. So after this, there's no monarchy. We have a period of time called the Interregnum. Uh, there will be a Republican government established called the Protectorate, and that will essentially be a military dictatorship that's ruled by Oliver Cromwell, who gives himself the title Lord Protector. And during this time, uh, we're reflecting Puritan ideas. Uh, Todd talked a little bit about this in the last session, about sort of the things that were allowed and not allowed in a Calvinist society. And so because he is Calvinist, Puritan, they will ban sports, they're going to close theaters, they're going to censor the press. Um, they'll welcome the immigration of Jews, which is uh, something that's important here. And Cromwell dies in 1658. And shortly thereafter, we are going to see that the English people are ready to restore the monarchy. And to do that, they look to who is the next in line in the Stuart family. And that will be Charles I's son, Charles II. So we restore the monarchy under Charles II. Um, we will bring him back. And he's been in exile in the Netherlands. Both the Houses of Parliament and the Anglican Church are also restored. 
And in fact, now we're going to have a piece of legislation called the Test Act that makes sure that only Anglicans are going to hold public office. So we're going to try to stave off any future Puritan uh, problems. The Puritans and Catholics are both stripped of many rights. Um, but again, we have fundraising problems here, right? So Parliament is going to refuse to give an adequate allowance to Charles II, and he will form sort of a secret alliance with the person that Todd just talked about, Louis XIV, and he promises that he will gradu gradually re-Catholicize England, and he will also convert. So he does convert on his deathbed, and when he dies, his brother, Charles II, will become king. And this is going to start again to sort of bring up all of these sentiments that we thought had kind of been put to rest with the restoration of the monarchy. Um, James II is Catholic, and this is going to prove to be unacceptable to Parliament. So a whole lot of things ensue here where James II has a son who's going to be raised Catholic, and that will end up provoking the Glorious Revolution, which is, again, another date that is absolutely, I think, essential to AP Euro. And so Parliament is going to offer the throne, and you can see in the image on the right the presentation of the Bill of Rights that's coming to William and Mary. Mary is James II's Protestant daughter, and she is married to William of Orange in the Netherlands. And James II and his wife and son will flee to France. William and Mary will be crowned as monarchs together in 1688. And the Glorious Revolution happens. It's a change in monarchy in England. And it's called Glorious because we don't usually associate uh, bloodless revolutions when they happen. We're usually thinking about violence. And this is one that happens without violence. And so maybe even more important than the Glorious Revolution is what comes right after it. And that is 1689, the English Bill of Rights. And so this will ensure the supremacy of parliament. It really tips sort of that scale of power in parliament's favor with a constitutional monarchy moving forward. Um, laws will be made only in parliament. It will have to be called once every three years. There will be an independent judiciary that will be established. Having a standing army will be prohibited in peacetime. And there will be definite rules that only a Protestant moving forward can inherit the throne. So all of this has been this long between 1603 to 1688 with the Glorious Revolution, this slew of Stuart monarchs that ends up with William and Mary and the supremacy of parliament going forward. So we have a strong constitutional monarchy where across the English Channel and in Russia, we still have pretty strong absolute monarchy going on. All right, so today for our skill practice, we're gonna be talking about beginning the, the way you will begin essays with either the long essay or the LEQ, and that is with contextualization. So our skill of contextualization asks us to identify and describe a context and explain how a specific historical development or process is situated within a broader historical context. And depending on your teacher, you may have had a different a variety of ways that your teacher gets you at context. And we have used other acronyms in the past. We've used GeoSprite, there's Persia, but Todd and I have hit upon one that we really like, and this is to classify learning through grapes. And so all of this is, is an acronym for you to start to think about how you can contextualize the topic of your prompt. So we can do G for geography. That's really what's the place, what's going on. We can talk about religious, uh, religious, our beliefs, our influences, our practices. Todd talked about religion yesterday, and we've touched on it again today, and how religion interwines itself into our different topics. Achievements, what are people doing that makes them successful? What are the arts, the literature, the scientific innovations? Do we have medical advancements? All of that is for achievements. Politics, what's going on with authority? It's just what we've been talking about today. Who is in power? What's the language of diplomacy? What are the laws that are created during this time? E is for economics. What's going on with money, right? Do we have trade? Who's doing the financing? What are the policies that drive the finance during this time? And last, socially, what are people doing, right? Um, we have ideas of ethnicity. What's going on with gender? What, is, what are the roles of women during this time? And what is the hierarchy of the social classes and where do different people fit in 
to that hierarchy. So Todd, um, and I really like grapes, but that may not be the one that your teacher uses and that's totally fine. Uh, but just start to think about how you might get at context and Todd's gonna walk us through some examples here. So we're talking about structure for context for contextualization. That is one of the skills on the AP exam that is that is tested. And we see it often with the long essay question or the document based question. And so one of the challenges students have is, gosh, I don't know how to write context. How do you do that? And so as Katie just unpacked the, the acronym grapes or GeoSprite or Persia, your teacher may have something different. Those are one of the ways that you can start thinking about it and you have a strategy when you're in that timed exam. So let's just take this prompt. It's a, a 20th century prompt, but evaluate the most significant innovation to affect the course of World War II, okay? So if we, when we create this introductory paragraph structure, this is gonna be your intro paragraph for LEQ or DBQ, we wanna begin broadly like a funnel and then we wanna narrow it down to our argument or thesis. So that's what this inverted triangle is supposed to give us. So construct that historical context, begin broadly, then narrow down by becoming more specific while you lead into the claim or thesis. So what does that look like when we construct a sample paragraph for the prompt we just gave you? So you see grapes on the left, geography, religious achievements, political, economic, and social. So you go into your exam, you've got this in your head, and you all of a sudden you have a piece of context, contextualization you need to write. And so I could just begin writing. The Second World War in Europe took place with Germany at the forefront events. That's geography, that's place geography. My next sentence, the German Nazi party led by Hitler came to power by taking advantage of a dire economic situation resulting from the Great Depression. So I'm talking about politics here and economics here, right? In one sentence. And again, I'm starting to build that context. I can continue. The Nazi party also spewed racist and anti-Semitic propaganda as part of their social agenda. So I pulled again from grapes. I've got a social statement that again is building context toward answering the question. When in power, the Nazis announced they would no longer abide by the disarmament clauses of the Treaty of Versailles and quickly established a military draft. So I have political going on in there in that sentence. And then I have one more sentence I'm building in this paragraph. The Nazis put scientists and engineers to work refining weapons and using the newest technologies to further their social and diplomatic agendas. So now I've pulled from the A or the achievements because this is about innovation. And so I've worked, started really broadly and I'm narrowing it down into that innovation and I'm almost ready to, then to make my argument. So what the whole paragraph would look like is this, there's our inverted triangle. I have my, what was it? Five sentences I've built. So it's substantial. It's not just a passing phrase and the rubric says that. It's a substantial contribution you've made that's introducing the reader into this piece of history. And then what you need to do still in this paragraph is to insert your thesis and claim with a line of reasoning, which Katie is gonna pull us through. Thanks, Todd, I think that's great. And I think it's really important to remind everyone that you're not needing to use all of those letters and grapes. It's just a way to get at what you remember about the background of the topic of the prompt that you can kind of funnel your way into what the actual prompt is about. So I really do like the mnemonic devices. Acronyms really work well here. So I think that that's great. Um, like Todd said, I'm a strong believer in starting the opening paragraph with context and ending it with a thesis that responds to the prompt. And that gets into our skill of argumentation, which asks us to make a historically defensible claim, a claim and support with relevant and specific uh, evidence and explain how these evidence support your argument. So when we're doing the thesis statement, part of the rubric is that you not only take a position or, or have a claim, but also that you have a line of reasoning. So we're gonna establish a position or an argument that you can defend with evidence. And for the DBQ, you need the content and the interpretation of the documents to support your argument. And for the LEQ, you're gonna support your argument with appropriate historical knowledge that you know about the time period, right, about the topic. Um, I'm really a big believer, and I think Todd would probably agree with me, to use the language of the prompt to create your thesis or claim. This is not simply restating the prompt, but to use the language that's in there to structure as you're making your claim. You're gonna answer and you have to provide that answer. You have to take a position and you have to provide the line of reasoning, but use the words in the question because that really gives you a roadmap 
to make sure that you're doing a good job. So let's take a look at, at structure. The, the prompt that Todd just spoke to you about was evaluate the most significant innovation to affect the course of World War II. So if we're writing a thesis or claim to answer that question, I'm a strong believer in using the words in the question to start this off, right? The most significant innovation to affect the, world, the course of World War II, we've used the language of the prompt, was, and now we are coming up with the answer. Right? So that's for an LEQ. We are giving what our, our historically defensible answer is going to be. And now we're going to move on to explaining our line of reasoning. So we're not only just stopping at answering the question, we're making sure that we explain why we're answering the question that way. So I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in using the word because it's not the only word and your teacher may have another way that, that they've taught you to get into the line of reasoning, but I think it's really straightforward to use the word because and to explain why you chose that response. And you can see here, here's the rubric for the DBQ and the LEQ. And if I had my way, I'd flip these and have con context as A and thesis claim as B, but that's okay, we can deal with this. So if we're starting off the top of that triangle with B, we were describing a broader historical context relevant to the prompt, right? And as Todd said, it's not just a phrase or a reference. So what Todd showed you was a really nice meaty context with different parts of that GRAPES acronym. Um, so, so I really like that. And then narrowing that down and ending with A, responding to the prompt with a historically defensible claim that establishes a line of reasoning and making sure that you're not just restating or rephrasing the prompt. And so not, you're not required to use sort of the little outline that we just talked about, but I think that if you, if you get in the habit of doing this, it's gonna be a road map to making sure that you get the points here. Um, and this is word for word the same for both the document-based question and for the long essay question. Here and here. So we got it. All right, so our homework for today is going to be to practice with one of the LEQs from last year's exam and the 2021 exam to practice what we just talked about, sort of starting that inverted triangle and moving down from context and using grapes or whatever acronym your teacher uses, and then doing a thesis statement that has an answer and provides a line of reasoning. And just like the SAQs that we talked about in the last session, the LEQ allows a student to choose between different time periods. And so we're going to let you choose for your homework if you want to do the early part of the course, which is evaluate the most significant effect of the printing press from 1450 to 1650, or a little bit of the middle of the course, evaluate the most significant effect of the Enlightenment on European society during the period 1688 to 1815 or the later part of the course, which is evaluate the most significant cultural effect, cultural effect of World War I during the period 1918 to 1939, so during those interwar years. And as you're choosing this, I'm going to go ahead and highlight something that I already said about the anchor dates. Um, I know I just mentioned that 1688 here is a date that I would want my students to know. The same goes when we move in our later sessions to the Congress of Vienna. 1815 is definitely a year that the College Board and we want you to know. And these are the interwar years, the end of World War I until the beginning of World War II. So it's really important that you have a sense of chronology and that you also know some of these key dates so you can start to be thinking about that as you're studying for the exam. All right. Todd. Okay, so what should we take away? And uh, really great job, Katie, of walking us through um, how to build the argument and how to get us into looking at those different prompts and how they'll have a choice of those prompts. So today, session two, we talked through absolutism and constitutionalism very quickly, and our skill development was focused around constructing contextualization and thesis argument claim for LEQ and DBQ. And your homework then is we want you to write a context thesis paragraph from one of the three choices that Katie gave you. And then tomorrow, we'll start by unpacking a sample. So you can use yours to compare against the samples that we're looking at. So session three, our content tomorrow is gonna to be scientific revolution enlightenment. And then we're gonna go further with the LEQ and DBQ and talk about what is evidence and that complexity point for the DBQ and the LEQ and how we use evidence to support a claim. So we'll be building that in session three and you can see look ahead at session four, we'll get into French revolution and Napoleonic era, okay? as we work on building a full essay response. Hey, Katie, I'm not sure, 
but do you know what did the buffalo say to his son when he dropped him off at school? I don't know, Todd. What did the buffalo say when he dropped his son off at school? Bison. 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 Everyone right. knows this, Katie. Everyone knows this. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching today. All right. Take care. <laughs>